Our third topic is what can be done? We've touched on this a little, but now let's address it head on. Um, Carrie Kivenen is a former Secretary General of the European School System. Carrie, we're going to try some screen sharing, I believe. Do you want to try sharing it before you speak? Yes, if possible. Yeah. Make sure that we can make this work. If it doesn't work, I can talk. Okay, you should. I don't want to teach you how to suck eggs, but there's a. You see the button at the bottom that says share screen? There we go. Fantastic. I'm, I'm sorry to, to use PowerPoint, but um, that's fine. And if you can be very close to your microphone, that would help. Thank you. All right. Okay. What sure. to do? Yeah. Um, a fact about is a Finnish fact checking organization, and already five, four years ago, we noticed that fact checking is always coming too late. It's uh, after the something has already said and, and written and the, the wrong information, disinformation has been spread. So we decided to go for education. And the idea was to adapt the fact-checking methods to the school environment. We did it in Finland. And we have these four statements, which are valid all over. We have been in a lot of seminars all over the world. Digital information literacy should be included in the national curriculum. Teachers should be trained and they should have tools and methods to deal with this information disorder. And schools should provide students with digital information literacy skills and critical thinking skills. And the interaction between the specialists, journalists, media experts, fact checkers with the schools and teachers would be welcomed. So we have done this. Uh, we have kind of supported teachers uh, inside of the Finnish uh, uh, curriculum to deal with social media issues in the classroom context. We have empowered students with critical thinking and digital information skills to resist mis- and disinformation. And we have activated students to verify their social media content. I already spoke about the new challenge, which is how to find information from the library, which is a, a very well organized, where the information is really at its place, to the world where the uh, search engines are based on the algorithms and they are giving millions of hits and for example if I would be a site looking for information about Camel I would be first uh, guided to British rock band secondly uh, Camel Tupacco and third Amazon Camel 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 com uh, site. There is a huge difference on uh, text uh, in online environments and offline environments. We have learned to read the traditional way, but we should be learning the new skills, how to handle the information coming in the online environments. Because the, the platforms, they are made uh, and they are designed to commercial interest, to capture our attention, to monetize our data and to predict and influence our behavior. They know a lot of about us. And this leads in many cases to the extremism and spread of the disinformation. There are, according to latest research, this is coming from Max Planck Institute, Kosu Rava, I'm working with her in a project. And there are, according to their opinion, four entry points to handle it. Uh, policymakers, law and ethics, regulations, technology, the big platforms, they can use the same algorithms to do something good than they do to get a maximum uh, uh, profit for their company. And also the science. Uh, there is very little studies made about the psychological and social effects on behavioral and cognitive uh, behavior, behavior in the online environments. And then education, and I'm going to speak about this education, uh, school curricula should include digital information literacy. What is this digital information literacy? Uh, it can be defined as a set of skills and abilities which everybody needs to undertake information related tasks. How to discover, access, interpret, analyze, manage, create, communicate, store and share information in the digital environment. There has to be on somewhere behind ability to think critically and to make 
balanced judgment. And this is something where the education comes in. And this is very crucial from the democracy point of view, because uh, if people are not able to find correct information, they are not able to, uh, to be uh, critical citizens or informed citizens. Finland has been leading all the media literacy uh, rankings for many years. Our government has produced Finnish media education leaflet. It can be downloaded. And our curriculum is really well made, I have to say. I've been working 30 years abroad, so I can uh, praise Finnish curriculum. Because um, we call it multiliteracy in Finland, which means media and information literacy. It's something starting from early education, going through the whole school curriculum. Also, the thinking and uh, learning to learn is very important part. But we have noticed very recently that this, this is not enough. And in fact, we are at this very moment uh, uh, revising the uh, instructions for teachers concerning the information management. And we are kind of creating uh, this kind of um, new reading skills information. Uh, so it starts with very early education and uh, there is a systematic uh, kind of structure where we are teaching children how to go online environment uh, complications. Uh, we are also very much uh, teaching uh, and trying to uh, create opportunities for students to uh, learn the critical thinking. And uh, we, we, in the curriculum, it's in a very uh, crucial part so that the pupils are able to clarify unclear information. They are able to rec recognize and evaluate different arguments coming from different uh, sources, and they are able to um, cope with differences. But we have noticed that teacher training is needed. Teachers who have got their education uh, far beyond the internet was uh, developed and before the handhelds were uh, coming into market, uh, they are kind of feeling unsure how to deal with these things. And in fact, about Edu, we have been organizing a lot of teacher trainings. We have written guidebooks for teachers. We support the national curriculum by doing a kind of extra activities for the teachers. According to our uh, point of view in the digital information literacy toolkit, we should have uh, different elements. And it's not only reading, there is um, the understanding the difference between online and offline environments, the difference between the media scenes of students and their teachers and parents, um, interaction with the experts, uh, science is more than opinion, which sources are reliable, how to classify misleading information, how to deal with confusing content, and algorithm literacy or awareness, how to verify the authenticity of photos and videos, and the last but not least, how to take care of the privacy and digital footprint. 10 seconds, Carrie. Okay, two ideas. We have noticed that um, there are so much information in the world that we should not spend our limited attention span to the rubbish. So we are kind of promoting strategic ignoring strategy. So there is so much uh, rubbish we can put away and go straight to the point. And then, uh, lateral reading is that traditionally we are going to the um, text, we are analyzing the text, and we are sometimes spending a lot of time and energy on analyzing something which is totally biased. So the, the traffic, online traffic rules for, for online environments is check first who is behind the information, what is the evidence, and what the, who, the, does the other sources say. I stop Thank here. You. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And let's sort out the screen. There we go. And now over to uh, Richard Allen, European from the European Digital Media Observatory. Thanks very much. Just to, then to start with a bit of history, um, the European Union institutionally started getting engaged in the disinformation subject, sort of 2018, when everybody else was also getting excited about this after the events of, of 2016 and 2017. Uh, sunk in. That was obviously at the end of 
that cycle. And so there was no scope for the EU to legislate. The EU needs three to five years anyway, as people who have been MEPs will recognize. So there's no way that the EU was going to sort of pass any kind of legislation on disinformation. Um, there's also a really interesting kind of healthy, I think, skepticism about uh, legislating in this space in the EU, particularly driven by people like Commissioner Viri Orova, who is leading on this because she grew up in a state where the government control the media landscape. And so particularly from, uh, as I say, those who come from uh, territories that were formerly run by communist regimes, there's a sort of innate uh, skepticism and, and a concern about rushing to legislate. So as a result, the EU came up with a, a code of practice, which is a self-regulator instrument, both out of necessity, no time to legislate, and desire uh, as a sort of wish to, to go carefully in this area that may end up getting superseded to a certain extent by this Digital Services Act, which is a key instrument in this new 2019-2024 legislative cycle. But even in the Digital Services Act, I think it's actually holding back a little compared with the UK legislation in proposing more of a co-regulatory model rather than the EU sort of rushing into this space. Whereas if you look at the UK Online Safety Bill, uh, I think the British government are much more keen to be directive and use Ofcom to tell uh, social media companies what they should or shouldn't allow, um, uh, which is itself is very interesting. We'll see how that survives. But anyway, as part of all of that, um, the e, uh, uh, this sort of self-regulatory landscape, that a small amount of European Commission funding was directed towards setting up this thing called the European Digital Media Observatory. I'm on it as a volunteer. I, arguably, I'm doing my, some of my penance for having spent time at Facebook is to give back by uh, trying to deal with um, or, or some of the European responses to, to disinformation. Um, it, it's run by the European University Institute. It has a small secretariat there and a group of interested people. And it does what I think the EU does in the internet space really well, because uh, you get a lot of value for money, which is pull together networks of people working in the same area. So there are long-standing networks working things like child safety, where all the different national child safety experts get together in, in an EU uh, forum or EU-sponsored forum. We're doing the same. A lot of our work is doing the same in two areas. One is fact-checking. So we have a, a forum, a space, and some tools for fact-checkers across the EU. Um, so that brings them together and I think adds some value because a lot of what they're doing is very common. Uh, and we're also doing it for media literacy organizations. So it's a space where media literacy organizations can uh, engage with each other within the banner of this EDMO. And then the third area, which is the one I'm mainly spending my time on, is around research. Uh, and there are two pillars to that. One is, one is pulling together all the research that's being done. And frankly, Kari cited some of it in, in his slides, but frankly, there's a lot we still don't know and re really fundamental questions. For example, you know, when you think about something like anti-vax misinformation, one hypothesis is an individual goes online, sees one piece of anti-vax information and cancels their vaccination appointment because it's persuaded them to go off. The other hypothesis is, look, people see this stuff, but they know it's all bullshit and they don't really care. And the people who are not going to get a vaccination anyway don't change their minds, but neither do the people who are going to get vaccinations. And, and if it's the second one of those we're in a very different space. It's like, in a sense, it's a much less serious problem than if we're in the first one. And the only way we can really understand this is through research. Uh, and people like Reuters Institute and others are doing the research that we need. And there's lots of institutions and, and there's a Danish academic who's leading this for us, trying to get together one corpus of research so we can have evidence-based policymaking because we actually understand you know, what the real world effects of misinformation are. And then the bit within that that I'm working on is, getting data out of the platform. So people raise questions around algorithms and things today. So getting the data from the platforms to the researchers, which is much more complicated than people think. And if I say the words Cambridge Analytica, I hope people will understand that. Cambridge Analytica uh, was associated with a, 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 a so apparently a research organization at the University of Cambridge who wanted data for research. And we kind of all know what happened from that. So it is not as simple as saying, look, I'm, I'm a good researcher platform, just give me your data, it'll be fine. No, uh, and particularly since the GDPR is in force, we need a proper legal framework where everybody is protected. The platforms are protected if they hand the data over, the researchers are protected for using the data because it's often sensitive and political and everybody's protected. So um, I'm I've, uh, uh, working with some others to create a working group where we try and work through all those data protection questions to enable a lot more sharing between uh, platforms 
and um, uh, researchers in Europe so we can answer some of these fundamental questions. So that's what we're doing. We've got a little bit of funding to do this. I say it's quite a, a lean organization, but it's really networking people working on disinformation in the European Union and trying to produce really good uh, qualitative research and tools that, that allow people to understand the phenomenon and in particular then craft you know, good policy responses to it. So something like the eventual shape of the Digital Services Act. 10 seconds. We hope will be informed by the, some of the work that we're able to do. So that's Ed, Bob. Thank you, thanks very much. And over to Richard Reed of the, and I'll remind you, CEO for the Association of Online Publishers. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I'm not qualified to talk to any of the politics here. So what I'm gonna briefly try and share is, is my observations, what I believe is, if you like, is a snapshot of, <coughs> excuse me, considerations I know publishers to be taking towards, um, you know, effectively trying to find a resolution to this problem. Um, some do think there is a simple answer to the problem already, uh, and that's letting audiences define quality for themselves. Um, and by this, I mean um, effectively laying out clear details about media sources and credibility. Um, the thought being that publishers can empower uh, readers to make informed decisions about truthfulness and, and the way that is done is by um, adopting some of these fact checker offerings such as NewsGuard, Trust Project, which is effectively applying a third party labeling that acts on, a, uh, on an independent sort of, if you like, nutritional label for the web content type idea. Um, and it includes social. Um, one really interesting um, sort of insight for me certainly was the British Medical Journal, the BMJ, um, which is, as, as many of you I'm sure are aware effectively operates um, behind a paywall providing content for its subscribing professional medical practitioners. Um, but um, they were alarmed, if you like, by the ever-changing uh, situation and, and disinformation around the coronavirus situation. And so they made an open decision to remove that paywall to provide access to people to be able to get access to the facts but what they do also do within that is they openly state uh, where there may be room for de debate around information provided and uh, whether content is peer-reviewed so in other words show their workings um, but we touched on this earlier as, as well as helping uh, readers tell fact from fiction addressing if you like this disconnection will mean uh, tackling the other key issue which is underrepresentation. Um, when it comes to trust, um, this need is particularly great as the dominance of certain voices, as we've seen over time, many, uh, many of these voices means that stories simply don't resonate with a broad range of audiences. Um, what's required really is further industry-wide effort to give representation for different communities. Um, although uh, specialist publications are critical, um, we must strive, if you like, for a world where dedicated and major titles both deliver uh, diverse perspectives. Um, like any complex challenge, there isn't one quick and easy fix. Improving trust and truth is going to call for higher transparency and accountability, which has obviously been touched on a lot today at multiple levels. And it's not easy, always easy, to walk the fine line between producing content that's generally popular and upholding responsible standards. Uh, but aiming for an even balance is paramount, I think. Uh, we all feel that now going forward. And doing so starts with acknowledging, and I think this is something that I've heard from some of the, the speakers in the room, uh, my colleague opposite me in particular, which is acknowledging the issue with our own bubbles and, and the need to inspect that. Secondly, I think publications must embrace their capacity to become the change makers. Um, uh, we provide informed media, we have um, um, engaged audiences, and we have the ability to lead as the change makers. And by that, I'm suggesting ideas that I know um, some news gatherers are, are considering, which is, you know, raising that bar on internal practices. Um, that goes a long way, greater transparency around how you bring those stories, um, but also uh, fostering real change, you know, whether that's the idea of small steps such as following 10 outlets um, with opposing views um, through to understanding other opinions, or if you like, as I suggested earlier, um, joining the movement for the push to a reform on how social platforms rank and share content. That, you know, it is their secret source, it's their secret box. You've touched on some very good reasons why that data is protected under GDPR, but equally, um, 
you know, it, it seems so ridiculous sometimes. And, and, and in the other commercial world that we all operate in as publishers, there are some absolute ridiculous elements where um, a machine makes a decision and there is no human intervention. And, that, and that's a real problem. Thank you, uh, that's perfect. We're just making sure our screen continues to work. Because, uh, oh, I could do that, how about that? That's a good idea, I'll change the... Sorry, we're being threatened with the TV going on to standby for those of you on Zoom. Um, Isabel, could you, I've, I've just changed the view. So um, I'm going to come to the people on Zoom first um, to comment now. We're going round the room. Um, are you prepared? Are you happy to receive? Yep. Okay, so Nick, if you would like to begin. We can't, oh, you're going to have to go back to the beginning and unmute yourself. If oh, you that's my fault. The first thing is that I think that the Finnish approach, as we have just heard 10 minutes ago, is really interesting and important and helpful. And that we should leave the meeting today adopting that as an agenda. He's, he's really on to something important. If I could add something to that, one single thing that I think is as important is that we have to repair the broken business model of mainstream news. It doesn't matter whether you finally get an honest regulator. It doesn't matter if you have internal ethics and high bars and all the rest of it. That is, right now, as we've entered this age of information chaos, we need a body of people who have the resources and the skills to go out and tell you what's true and what's false. It may be difficult, Richard, but that's the aim. And the money has been taken out of that by the internet. And it's, it's not just an optional extra. It is crucial, as important as the stuff that Carrie's talking about, that we put the mainstream media back into a position where it can do its job. So I'd, I'd like that to be right up at the top of the agenda, along with the Finnish approach. If you had a world in which those two things were up and running, you'd have a world in which truth was starting to, to win the battle against falsehood. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, and now Shafak, if you're still with us, you were there a moment ago? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm still here. Super. Yeah, I mean, in, interesting, we, we talked a lot about online, but also there's some international players. I mean, RT News is probably the main one, but there's lots of others, the Chinese state news channel. A lot of them are doing English language. And that's not for the domestic audience. That is to influence Western societies and other English speaking societies. And what we're seeing is that others are trying to follow. I've seen content now produced by Turkey and they have their particular slant on things. So it's not only kind of issues we have of disinformation slash fake news on the internet. We also have it in terms of broadcast. Uh, in terms of the EU, I think the EU Disinformation Lab has done some fantastic work over the last couple of years on unearthing, let's be honest, quite frankly, I would say fronts of deep states of, you know, foreign countries trying to influence in the, you know, politicians in the European Parliament, politicians in America, UK, with various branding of newspapers that have not existed for decades. So there's a real problem of getting to the bottom of these places. And often they're very amateurish uh, enterprises as well that have been exposed to all five, you know, a dozen, two dozen of these so-called uh, publications all originating from one website, one uh, address in a particular capital or elsewhere. So there's a lot, a lot of stuff out there that's been targeted towards us in the West to influence our policy makers, our decision makers, whether it's in Westminster, whether it's in Brussels, Strasbourg, or in Washington, in the in Capitol Hill, in terms of their kind of reactions towards different countries and their relationships. Uh, I'll leave it at that. I think I've run out of time, Judith. So, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. And now, Alexandra. 
Thank you, Judith. Well, me too, I, I adore the Finnish model. I think that there are many takeaways also how to regain trust in media and democracy, speaking about my home country. But for our discussion, uh, four takeaways, I think uh, the crucial is empowering uh, civil society to identify and expose uh, this information. Also create independent regulatory body but a body that can facilitate the work of fact checkers, but uh, by investing in content and uh, promoting the fact checking platforms. And last but not least, I think uh, organizing events like that and raising awareness uh, on wider stage about the negative effects of disinformation, fact uh, um, threats, and uh, you know freedom of speech. So the, the more we talk about that, the more we raise our awareness about the negative impacts of, of uh, this information, uh, the more we will be able to come with solutions to it. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Evan, would you, could we pick up with you? Thanks. Yeah, I just have a couple of thoughts on what's been said. Those were three very interesting presentations, and I certainly agree with what's been said about them. Um, in terms of research, one of the things that I want to just reiterate is the importance of understanding survey evidence, okay? It, uh, so Reuters, for example, great organization, no doubt, but they shouldn't, as they did, produce a, a survey and publish it saying that the, the trust in the media is 52%. Not only is it meaningless, it's, 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 it's misleading, it's misinformation, because you have to stratify it by broadcast media, you have to stratify it by printed press and then you've got to stratify it by social media and then you've got to ask what's the reach of each of those if you want to have a meaningful figure that's trackable over time or comparable between countries on trust in the media and what the problem is that's not the only metric it's no good me pronouncing on whether i have much trust in sky news if i don't watch it so again you've it's got to be among you've got to drill down and they've been very sloppy and it really annoyed me. And they were very, they were BBC defensive, if I can use that term. We never do anything wrong when we raised it, but clearly their headline on some study was wrong. Mm -hmm. However, the data is there and it's very important. And so when Stephanie made the point about how the UK media is more diverse than citing Michelle Hussein and Amal Rajan, that is broadcast, it's the BBC and it's broadcast. It's not, as, as Marcus has pointed out, it's not the UK media. It's UK broadcast has oases of good practice in that respect. Uh, that's important to say. Um, and I finally want to just come back to this point about the need to, the reason why the presentation we have from Kari is so important is that I don't think realistically you'll, never, you'll ever be able to, to sort this problem by censorship. I think that's generally been accepted. So for example, when it comes to violent pornography, the starting point has to be, they're gonna see this stuff, let's have effective sex education in schools, which we don't have. And we, we still have, there was a case the other day, the government finally lost in the courts because some school, some Catholic school had been teaching as they're allowed to in this country, because, because we're still a religious country, it seems, that, that men must take the lead in sex. I mean, you know, women must be submissive in schools, in this country, in 2021, right? Absurd. So until we get effective education, both in terms of critical thinking and in terms of media and digital literacy and in terms of um, safety, th then you're gonna be fighting a losing battle because I don't think you'll ever put the internet genie fully, fully back at, back at it. I'm not saying it's a, only one approach, seconds. but you need to have, you need to start and end with education and effective education. I know you agree with that. I'm just saying that that, that has to be stressed more. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. And Marie? I would like to defend the Reuters <laughs> um, um, survey. I, I watch it every, I look at it every year and they do exactly that. They dig down to all the countries, all the different platforms, not on the headline, there we have it. That we're back to the, to the grubby issue of amplification of poor, of <laughs> but, um, but the actual research is excellent. 
Um, anyway, sorry, can that not count as my <laughs> minute? Yes, okay. <laughs> we're near the end, I'll let right. you off that bit. Um, so first of all, like everyone else, the, um, the BBC workshops look very similar to the Finnish workshops. And the brilliant thing about the Finnish workshops is it's on the curriculum and that's exactly what's needed. You know, we have all these marvelous schemes, you know, we're hearing about things that you're doing in you know, one place, another, really, until you have a critical mass and people work together, they're pinpricks. So until in the UK, it's the Department of Education dealing with it, not uh, culture and media, um, then you know, we're not gonna make enough progress. The BBC can go into classrooms all day, every day, and we're not gonna do the same thing as the Finns and we know it works because in Finland we know that they, they have much lower rates of um, being misled by um, uh, misinformation so it's fabulous to know that. Um, so in terms of what else we do, um, I mean the BBC is doing things it never used to do which is it partners. I mean you know we're working on something called the Trusted News Initiative which means although our journalists are busy holding platforms to account, corporately we are working with the platforms to try and find ways of working together, Absolutely. you know, in terms of um, how do we red flag misinf harmful misinformation that has to be a bar from spreading. We're looking at how we can create training programs globally for journalists in that parts of the world with, you know, much, you know, lower, um, what's the word really, with lower training who don't who lack verification skills all the things the new modern skills that you need um teaching everyone to think like journalists or think like fact checkers think you know thinking differently we still teach children we still as adults we're thinking analog we're not thinking digitally um and so you know education and the way we work is is pretty old-fashioned and and the bbc is trying to be part of a new digital world we we know that our content that goes out on the 10 o'clock news is fine. Everyone knows it's the BBC. It's pretty trusted. Most of our content globally now is you know, increasingly going out on social media platforms we have no control over. How do we, you know, is our brand even on the content we create nowadays? We don't know. We, we struggle with that. We need people to understand, A, that we create trusted news and B, that they recognize it when they see it. Um, and so a lot of work we're putting into globally is how do we work with Tencent. algorithms, social media platforms mm -hmm. and partners around the world so that there's a greater understanding of not just the BBC, but other trusted broadcasters and publishers so that people understand trusted news when they see it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and Irina, if you would... Thank you. Yes, um, I just want, I mean, I, I obviously very much agree with what Carrie was saying about education. It was a really impressive um, presentation. Thank you for that. And I think this is also going to be at the heart of the Liberal Democrat um, policy paper that, that we are in the process of drafting. But I wanted to pick up on one other point, which Richard, I believe, made, and that is on echo chambers, because um, it is a, a very, very important. I think we all fall into that trap. I certainly can speak for myself. Um, that we we increasingly become um, polarized because our own um, information bias is reinforced through the echo chambers that we move in on social media and elsewhere, um, you know, not least in these fora. And I think we mustn't forget that these echo chambers are reinforced through algorithms by the social media platforms. And this is where actually social media platforms do have an editorial role that they play today. And I think um, regulation needs to take that into account, make those algorithms more transparent so that we understand why we are getting certain content fed to us and not other content. And to counteract that apart from media literacy, as you rightly said, we need to actually make an effort to seek different opinions, which I think people don't do anymore because of information bias and because we don't really want to hear um, uncomfortable truths. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Stephanie, if you would like to take the microphone. Just very briefly picking up a point on, on <coughs> um, trust in media. Um, we, thanks, so to say, to the COVID pandemic, have never sold so many subscriptions. And this is the experience of mainstream media in, in the pandemic, that people were really looking for what they still thought. So they, they actually returned to uh, reading established mainstream media because they thought mm, in, in, I'm very I'm sitting at home I'm, I'm really worried and nervous and who do they turn to the established 
media that uh, was for such a long time the, the devil in the room. But um, I thought it was very interesting um, the points that Richard was making on how, what is now the evidence we will um, base future legislation on. And we talked a little bit about the case of Germany where they tried to introduce this law, but as far as I can follow it, it hasn't really got a grip of the problem of how you stop uh, misinformation um, distributed via, via platforms. Uh, we recently interviewed, which is just an interesting experience, um, only people who have a subscription with Die Welt can comment. And this has, uh, I mean, you can, of course, it's controversial, so why shouldn't not everyone comment on, on what we're writing? But the, the, the level of discussion is so much better now, um, probably also because the bots don't come through, but also because, especially with Brexit, I must say, in the last month since we introduced that, I really enjoy reading the comments because people, and not all of them, of course, but a lot of people have a very educated, very mature debate now on, on, on our side. So that gives you heart. Thank you. And Lucy? Thank you. Um, so thank you very much. They were very interesting um, presentations. Um, on education, um, my my pre-politics life was as a teacher. Um, I do want to say that I think that putting all the um, hope of solving this onto schools and educators is not going to work. <laughs> um, I'm really sorry, but um, a couple <coughs> of lessons, I mean, my goodness, we need better sex education, but a couple of hours in school is not going to make up for all the stuff that people see on the internet. Um, and, and while I'm really glad to hear that what's working, that, that what is going on in Finland has an impact, um, I suspect that there are a whole range of reasons why things are better in Finland and that it's not just about what happens in school. Um, and, I, and I don't think that we should feel that, um, I, I mean, it is really important that young people are better educated and, and helped to understand about misinformation and disinformation. Um, but I think we need to really think of this as a, as a much wider problem that's part of the solution, but it seems to me that it's only a relatively small part of the solution, not least because most people are not in school anymore. Most people have finished with school um, and, um, and we need to recognize that this is a whole society issue, um, which is why I think um, in the end, we've got to come back to regulation as part of the solution to this problem. Um, but I absolutely recognize that it's very, very difficult and it's very good to hear about the research that's going on into trying to understand what the impact of, of all of this is. The final point I wanted to make was about the BBC, which is to say thank you very much for the local democracy reporters. I think local journalism is actually really important and is one of the, was one of the first places what, that disappeared where good journalism disappeared was, was in local reporting. It's much more difficult to lie to people about what's going on in the place where they live because they can tell and they can see and they talk to their neighbours. Um, so actually um, make getting, getting that local level and local reporting back has been really valuable and useful. And I think that that's an area which perhaps we should have touched on more, but I do think it's really been helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Phil. Uh, yes, I was going to start with education as well. And I think it was uh, quite an interesting presentation. But um, as Lucy says, this is a whole science society issue and uh, relying entirely on education, it's going to be a very, very, very long burn. Uh, probably two two generations by which time things will have moved on a huge amount. It's going, to, but it's still a necessary a necessary part. I mean, uh, as a history student, the first thing I studied was historiography, which is basically critical analysis of of your source material. And uh, so the, this is there's plenty of um, history, if you like, of this kind of education and. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's absolutely necessary. Uh, on the second point, I, I was going to uh, say something about what Irina said, because that was going to be my second point, is the, the, diversity, the diversity. People actually uh, uh, exist in their own media silos to a large extent. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's a question of where you get this sort of trust and where you find it. And does it now have to be on an international level rather than a national level? Uh, because basically, if you know, um, if there's any subject you know a lot about and you see it reported in the press, they always get it wrong. Even, even the top quality uh, media will not get it quite right if, the, if it's something that you know a lot about. And uh, that must be the same for everybody. Um, so they're not quite, because truth is, truth is actually quite complex. And um, so that is going to be an extremely difficult 
um, job to try and sort of uh, adjudicate on what's true and what is not true. And it's probably going to be ineffective if it's done in the silos of nation states. So I think that's another point. If it's going to be done at all, it needs to be done at international level and independently. And uh, I think that's going to be a huge project and it may well never get off the ground. Um, so, <laughs> so that's a bit depressing, yes. But then the last thing was possibly we could we might well see a cultural change. I think uh, Richard sort of uh, suggested this could we we could start seeing some sort of cultural change within the media industry itself. Um, and but I think all three of those, I would say, um, we've got Ten to look seconds. at some ways forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to come back to the lead speakers for your concluding remarks. If anybody else would like to add a bit of a conclusion at the end, then do raise your hands. And we've got a little bit of time. I can add one or two to the list. But Carrie, over to you for your concluding remarks. Um, you probably noticed that education was only one of the options. There are a lot of other entry points why education is important and why um, the national curricula is the key that a little bit against what you said we are not teaching few numbers of this it starts in early education it goes through the primary and continues to the secondary in every subject so it's part of the culture of the school to learn how to find information correctly so and if we want to scale up something the curricula national curricula is the only way I mean, we can do conferences and teacher trainings, but it's very little number of teachers who get uh, trained. But if it's in the curricula, teachers have to do it. And um, I agree totally that this not should be only the students. I've been given a lot of uh, trainings for uh, uh, elderly people who are absolutely lost with the online environment. Uh, we have created this kind of uh, digital survival kit for pensioners. Mm -hmm. And it's hugely important for them because they, they do believe on what is written. And when they see it in screen, they are easy targets for all kinds of scams and frauds. And the last thing is that there is also a carrot. OECD has been quite clever. In the PISA 2025, there is a new competence, how to uh, evaluate and use scientific information for decision making. And all the countries who want to get good score on PISA have to now reflect on how to teach the 15 year olds uh, to deal with this kind of issues. Thank you so much for interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Richard Allen, could I just interject as I did with Marcus and say, could you um, address or mention the funding you've just received from Google? Are they trying to push the debate in a direction? or are they as confused as everyone else? Yeah, I'll come down. I'm just gonna to react to Carrie telling us about another PISA score that Finland can win at. Great, <laughs> um, we are envious. Uh, um, so the, on the funding specifically, so, so what Google has done is it has uh, given money to the Gulbenkian Foundation. So they've, they've literally handed money over where they have no control over it to an independent foundation. That money is for um, research into disinformation. It will be directed by uh, the European Digital Media uh, Observatory. Okay. So we, we will decide which research or, or advise on which researchers should receive that money. But Google is completely hands on. The structure has been deliberately set up so that Google has no say over it. And, and frankly, from their point of view, they don't want that because whenever they fund research, nobody trusts it because they funded it. So uh, they did want to make a contribution. We want to get money into the research community, but we wanted to create a structure where they, once they've signed the check, it's gone. It's Gulbenkian Foundation's money. Uh, and then Gulbenkian Foundation will give it to researchers on the advice of uh, European University Institute, Nedmo. We'll, we'll help pick researchers who, who can do things with it, independently of Google. So that's on that. And then just in my closing remarks, I just want to pick up on comments from both Nick and Lucy about funding, which I think is critical, to pick up on Evan's analogy. To a certain extent, we may be spending a hell of a lot of time worrying about who gets to run the blood, blood bank, whilst ignoring the fact that there's no blood left in it, because uh, it's all gone out. And, and if you look, um, uh, when Evan and I were at primary school, Exalt Infant School together in Sheffield, 
we could have bought a, a, a local Sheffield morning newspaper on the way to school in the morning and an evening newspaper on the way home. And if you read Alan Rus Rusbridge's memoirs and others, there was really easy money in local news. You had a monopoly over classified ads, over jobs ads, you were rolling in cash. And that's what allowed you to fund high quality local journalism. That money's gone, it's never coming back. And it, 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 we are left with this question, I think Nick's raised it, of you know, how many full-time professional journalists do we need to keep an eye on Shafak and his friends in Sheffield and the local courts and the <laughs> local hospitals? Is it 20, is it 50, is it 100? And having decided that, how much are they gonna cost and then who's gonna pay for it? And then critically, again, we can get a little bit hung up too much on the source of the income. I actually think the structure of the payment system is again the profound political question um, because if you give that money to government, whoever you tax, you give it to government and government directs it, they have an agenda or is it an independent foundation or is it you know the BBC or who is it? So deciding how many journalists we need as a society in different areas and then figuring out how to pay for them, I think is perhaps the most profound question when we're, when we're thinking about sort of truth uh, in media. Uh, and then critically from a political point of view, what are the structures that mean that that's genuinely independent and not captured by any uh, particular seconds. lobby? I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. And then Richard Reeves. Thank you. Um, uh, some of my work's been done, Marie. Thank you for the point of correction on the Reuters Institute, which is a separate think tank on this, this matter. And, and, the, and, and the complexity of detail is there. Um, I'm, I think the education point um, carries is, is, is really interesting. I think everyone agrees that, that this is such a complex challenge that it's just one part of it. Uh, but it's an important part and there is no quick and easy fix. Um, I think the most compelling, and, and it's because it's been every day of my life for the last six years since I took over running the AOP, which as I say, my, my, my job is to represent the interests of, of media owner organisations. And it's what Nick said um, about the broken business model. I, um, the BBC obviously in the UK to some degrees uh, is a bit of an exception to that rule. But um, I don't think it's lost on anyone in this room. I'm sure you all uh, uh, read in great detail the Cairn Cross port, and I'm sure you're aware of the impact that has on our society, the direct impact on local journalism. Um, but, you know, just to sort of try and um, frame it in such a way, you know, this, this you know, Nick, and, 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 and I'm sure other news groups would argue or discuss this with Nick around the fact that, you know, is it actually just down to a resource issue? Well, all of these businesses have been battling news gathering organizations as one example to create a sustainable future for themselves because now, and I only operate in the digital world, so I'll only talk to that, but 80% of the revenue um, that is spent through advertising um, makes itself to Facebook and Google and nowhere else. And um, those media organizations that are trying to sustain their businesses have learned to wean themselves off the dependency that existed for so long around advertising. But the risk to us as a society with them doing that and protecting and future-proofing their businesses is getting access to honest, trustful news is going to be even harder for yeah. the Joe blogs on the street and the kids going through education systems, it's all going to be behind paywalls. And I think for me, and, and I've always had this opinion, so but it's a private opinion. And I, 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 I struggle because I know it's not a sensible thing to say on public platforms. And this isn't me necessarily accusing politicians of anything, but when we talk about trying to defend the truth, I think politicians and people like myself, we all stood by and watched the decimation of that business model that Nick refers to. And I think um, um, I grew up and ended up in an industry where I didn't know how it worked, but my assumption was if a newspaper carried an ad in the same way as a newspaper's held accountable for what it says in a story, it is equally accountable for allowing commercial messages to exist in their environment. So my interpretation of life as a kid was that if that brand is in my dad's copy of the Times or whatever, it's probably a really good brand or entirely trustworthy. And I still am greatly challenged. I, I, I know a number of people that there's a lot of reasons why this can't be the case, but I am challenged by the fact that some of you have actually referred to um, uh, social media platforms as publishers today. Um, as you know, they rigorously defend the fact that they aren't because that's why they're not held accountable. But my view is, and I think it's, it could be the, the greatest gift that politicians can make for, you know, 
that business model that's so broken and my industry is, is, is that we should view the fact that if an organization supports commercial messages, wherever they place those commercial messages, they therefore, in order to have the privilege to support advertising, should by definition be accountable for everything that is on the page or when that commercial message appears. And I'll tell you what, if that had been the case economically and societally, we'd be in a very different place. Thank you. And Evan, for the final comment, Sorry, this is the final comment because it's going to be defensive. Let me make a broader point <laughs> first to, to well, make, make my point not so small minded um, about the Reuters Institute. We don't just face a crisis of misinformation. We face a crisis of trust in the UK anyway. And the barometer studies, the EBU barometer studies show that it's worse in the UK than almost anywhere else, even worse than some of the countries with more serious problems. Uh, than we have in terms of media freedom. Uh, and so even if we repair the, the information media, how do we restore trust? How do we show that it's repaired? And one way is not to have misinformation about the problem. And this is the point I made. In April 2020, Reuters put out a news release. I get it. Reuters Institute. Reuters Institute. I know what I'm talking about. Trust me. Reuters Institute for the Study of <laughs> Journalism in Oxford, my old constituency, said news media broadly trusted as source of coronavirus information. Right? That was the headline. That was purely based on a massive trust measure for the BBC. Okay? I 60%, which is very high because we're less trusting play. You know, doctors aren't that much higher, actually, in judges than 60% BBC News. ITV 40 and Channel 430 and newspapers way down. So news media is narrowly trusted as a source of input, not broadly trusted. And I wrote to Reuters and said, your headline, which was dutifully reported by the tabloids, saying, we're, we're broadly trusted, says Reuters. They said, oh, well, you know, it's just a headline. It's not, that, that's the way that that reached the population. And it's, that's a form of misinformation. And I expected better from Reuters because I admire them and I read their work. And, and, um, and thank goodness for the BBC, in fact. Um, you know, they flawed organization, but nevertheless, thank goodness, because they're rightly trusted. But the attacks that we're seeing on the BBC are not just damaging to the BBC, but will reduce trust overall, and therefore attacks ought to be justified and not made out of um, what are clearly, at least in part, uh, self-interested um, partisan attacks by okay, politicians and no, their rivals. Sorry. No, that's it. Well, I, uh, oh, oh, I wasn't to reply to Evan, actually. It was a 30 Steph seconds, but 30 seconds. It was Stephanie's point about what we saw during coronavirus was the evidence of people flocking to those news gathering organisations for that. The business model, Nick made point, the business model point was we live in a world of technologies that dominate the decisions. Those technologies block ads from or advertisers from appearing in those news pages. So actually, despite the traffic, Newspapers in the UK lost potentially 50 million pounds worth of revenue okay. because, again, stupid, ignorant technologies programmed by machines. Okay, and on that really optimistic note, <laughs> thank you, everyone. You have been fascinating. So good for you. Clap each other. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.